Welcome to Coming from Left Field, where we have conversations about politics, books, and current events with your host, Greg Gottles and Pat Cummings. Plutarch, born in 46 AD, was a prolific writer and moral philosopher. Here is his famous quote that recognizes the dangers posed by significant economic disparities. An imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. He nailed it. That was over 2,000 years ago. People were wearing tunics and sandals. Extreme wealth gaps still undermine the foundation of our society, leading to instability and conflict. Let's discuss. We're here today with uh, Rob Larson. Warm greetings, Rob. Hi, Pat. It's great to be we, here. We, we've got, uh, uh, you know, we have Greg in Pittsburgh. I'm actually in Tacoma with you in Tacoma. Well, no, I'm not in Tacoma. I'm in the Trump Tower uh, in Trump's office, as you can see. The Ren oh, is there's the Renoir, there's the all of the jewels, uh, and that's the office that I'm sure is used an awful lot. So that's good. You know, if you don't have gold on every surface, how do people know uh, that you have money? And and if you don't have a green screen, then you know what what the heck. So hey, we are here to talk to you about your book. I I I love this book, Mastering the Universe by Rob Larson, and it is what they do with their money and why you should hate them even more and this is a you're an economics professor uh been teaching for 13 years and uh you written a couple of uh written a couple of books that uh you know I, you're pretty prolific uh, for written four four books or so in the last 10 10 or so years is that right uh let's see economics uh was started in like 2010 and 2009 and it's actually an essay selection collection so like 15 years is probably more yeah. accurate and 13 years is how long i've been teaching out here on the west coast i've actually been teaching for come january 18 years oh uh, i was young at one time oh good well you're gonna be dying at the podium probably pretty soon that's a long time god willing so, hey, uh, you know, Greg grew up right now. You grew up in Terre Haute. Greg grew up in Danville. You're only an hour from each oh, other. Yeah. Yeah. So oh, you're kidding. That's fantastic, man. Ah, oh, Danville. Oh, yeah, wow. good. Hey, tell us about tell us about your book, uh, the um, Mastering the Universe, which is a Tom Wolfe quote, right? About the from uh, his one of his novels. Tell us about tell us about the book. Give me an overview. Yeah, sure. So, uh, yeah, the title is from uh, the famous expression uh, that's uh, supposed to describe the uh, high-flying Wall Street bankers and investors uh, from the original era of their being cut loose uh, before this current one uh, from the 1980s. Uh, yeah, mastering, Masters of the Universe, he called them tongue-in-cheek, of course, after the uh, children's series about a guy who fights a skeleton monster in cartoon form. Uh, and the, there was the bonfire of the vanities, I believe, was the... That the was it, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so the book is basically a uh, review of the insanely rich uh, ruling class in the U.S. and around the world. And uh, I feel like it's uh, a good place to turn to if you want to know, uh, you know, who is in charge, like who is all all of these things happening in front of us from our twisted elections to the climate crisis we are dealing with to, I mean, every other issue that we experience. It's you're looking at that wealth gap. It's the concentration of wealth in that very top echelon of households. So you got a chapter on like how much money they have, you know, in the U.S. and like other regions. They own all the stock, which is important. We can come back to that. Uh, we got a chapter on the lifestyle that they live, uh, which is the longest chapter, although no one ever complains about that, uh, mm -hmm. probably because that chapter is ridiculously juicy and full of stunning, outrageous uh, things that you spend money on when you're desperate to spend more of your money somehow. Uh, and you got a chapter on the different classes and how we define those and how they interact and fight each other. Chapter on uh, ruling class subspecies around the world. Got one on the climate. Uh, and then one on just the lies that people use to, uh, you know, justify the ruling class. Uh, many of them were used to justify kings, but others are new. So there's a variety in there. Uh, just a lot of short chapters, a lot of jokes. Try to uh, try to make uh, economics not incredibly horrible to consume. You know, um, mm -hmm. yeah. 
could take a well, look at you, you, you start by uh copying off uh uh, Thomas Piketty's paper, uh, Capital in the 21st Century, which is a, a book both Greg and I have, have read, which is a overview of the historic data of capitalism from the 18th century to present. And it's basically capital versus income and how capitalism is slowly, slowly making the rich richer <laughs> and, the, and creating a disparity between the rich and the poor. And that's um, that. That was a good good way to set the stage. So you set set the table with chapter one, just with the numbers. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, and I should say, yeah, Piketty is a uh, unique source. But the thing I lean on the most is a research consortium that he is one of the most prominent members of. And I always want to plug this uh, when I talk about the book because I relied on their hard work so much. Uh, the World Inequality Database, which uh, people. There she blows. Right. It, uh, it doesn't normally have a cut out of it. It's that's the, well, that's the green that's the screen. Hollywood green screen. special effect budget is causing that to appear that I, way. I I am going to link to this database for some you reason. Should, this yeah. wasn't on my radar. It is wonderful. You could just get lost in a rabbit hole uh, oh, it's, it's going great. through the the charts and such with this. So absolutely. And what's great about it? It is a really wonky address. So link is good. It's wid dot world. Just about the worst web address I ever heard. But the website's incredible. Um, heavily, you know, regularly updated. All of the globally senior uh, economists who study uh, wealth uh, inequality are a part of that project, uh, I believe. And they have, you can go down, they have individual pages for almost every country in the world, which is extremely uh, impressive, given the world's wretched data keeping on uh, the subject. Uh, but it's fascinating, and what you see is figures, of course, vary around the world, but the United States, just going by the classic uh, echelon, that 1%, the wealthiest 1% of households by net worth, uh, they own about 33% of U.S. wealth, not income, but wealth, you know, the assets, uh, counting bank balances and financial assets and real estate, all in about a third of uh, the wealth of the country belongs to just those richest one in 100 households, which is a stunning level of concentration. I mean, that's way up, of course, from that New Deal period from like the 30s through the 80s, uh, when their share was never small, but significantly smaller than this. And this is why they're in a position to buy up all of our media and spend hundreds of millions of dollars getting their billionaire buddies elected uh, president and so on. Uh, that didn't used to be so easy for them. Not quite back to the Gilded Age levels of wealth, which are more roughly estimated, of course, back in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're closing in on it. If we have one more big Trump tax cut, we could uh, close the gap. Uh, it depends, though. If we go to tariffs, that's a whole other tax regime. So... Uh, it's all up in the air right now, of course. But that's the basic picture. Other regions are similar. Some areas are more concentrated in how much wealth is at the top. I think the Arab world, if I the Middle East, that is, if I recall correctly, had the highest amount, which I believe, uh, I don't have that piece of data in front of me, but I believe it was 42 or 45 percent of all wealth belongs to that wealthiest 1 percent of royals, of politically connected people, and so on. Uh, fascinating uh, thing to see how that uh, varies around the world with that website. And, and if I remember right, um, with Piketty's book on capital, this trajectory is pretty much a straight line from, you know, uh, there was a couple of corrections in World War II and when unions were strong, uh, where there was wealth, uh, wealth and the distribution of the percentage of wealth was kind of going up at the same, at the same, at the same rate. And then it just went to went to hell in a handbasket with Reagan and the neocons. Uh, you you t tell me about the one statistic that if you look at wealth and the percentage of the distribution of wealth going up at the uh, at the same rate, if we were to to use that, you gave the statistic that was the Rand Corporation, I think that the wealthiest would be making half a million dollars uh, right now. And what, do you remember that, that, that study? Uh, yeah, I do. And I was hoping to see it here in the index of my book so I could pull it up quickly. Uh, looks like that one didn't make it into the index. 
Uh, yeah, it was. this was a really interesting RAND Corporation study. RAND, of course, the big government, primarily military uh, think tank and data contractor. Uh, they did just a piece of research, and they refer to it as a counterfactual. So it's about a non-existent reality, and they're very eager to point that out. Uh, and folks can just Google this. This is now in the public record, so people can uh, just take a look at this online. Just RAND Corporation, uh, you know, income per capita, counterfactual, something like that. You'll pull it up uh, quickly. Incredibly fascinating. Yeah, it just said, if you look back at what we just called the New Deal period, you know, the era from yeah FDR and the Depression all the way up to the Reagan Revolution in the 80s, uh, an era of much bigger government than we would uh, consider normal today, a lot more aggressive taxes on the rich, as we said, but also a lot more regulation of industries and the corporate property of that ruling class would get antitrust monopolies busted and they were regulated significantly more. You know, the EPA was created in that era. Uh, and during that period, as you said, we had a lot of strong economic growth there. This was the peak of American power and you know, World War II, rather than destroying our economy, stimulated it. And so people often refer to that post-war period as being the U.S. golden age. And you had strong economic growth, which in terms of just GDP and production we have today, but people are so pissed off today that they'll vote in someone who they kind of see as a tyrant because they just want to jolt to that system. So what's the difference? The difference is during the New Deal, because we had unions and progressive taxes like that, the as the economy grew and that increased over time, the income of most of the wealth brackets of the country all grew at about the same rate over time. Like you had participation in growth at, for basically the different classes, obviously there's a lot of different details there, but that's the broad pattern you see over those decades. Once we get to the 80s and 90s with the uh, neoliberal uh, political turn for the Democratic and Republican parties, that relationship ends. And famously, it's at that same point in uh, 1979 when productivity continues to increase as it has with interruptions since World War II, but average worker pay, average salaries stop increasing. They sort of stagnate going forward there. And so the RAND study just said, how about a counterfactual where we stayed with the same policy mix that we had through the New Deal through today? And it was, yeah, your wealthier people are making a fraction of their current incomes and merely merely several hundred thousand dollars a year how can anyone get by on so little rather than the numerous millions of income per year that we see in our reality but also in that uh, counterfactual like the average income for the average person is like up in to the six figure point it's incredible so it shows like and people should take a look at that study because it is like stunning this is what reagan and clinton it's that two right. those two administrations to transition us to neoliberalism of today that is what we lost with this and it's just funny yeah to see like the rand corporation which you know specializes in vietnam bombing optimization type studies uh, it's fun to see them do this kind of work greg before we get off chapter one how how much do you think this trajectory of the wealth disparity and income disparity and the you know the the, the line going straight up how much do you think this is responsible for us having trump I, I think the uh, Piketty study, the importance of it is that it goes way back. It doesn't mm -hmm. give you a snapshot, but a big, long picture of Sorry. capitalism's evolution. And it forces you to say that the trajectory of capitalism, when you do have a change in the relationship of equality, whether it's incomes or whether it's wealth, for the better of the working class, that has to be explained, not the other way around. In other words, capitalism always produces and reproduces inequality. That's the real message of that, of that book, Capital. And so he goes to lengths to show that what the French call the 30 glorious years after World War II really are a time of, I don't know, he doesn't go this far because he's a social democrat, but it's really a kind of Cold War compromise so that the Union movement, which threw all the lefties out in the 50s, uh, got this deal cut. If you participate and go along with us, we'll let your income growth march right along with productivity. It was a very rare thing, but it was really Cold War based. And of course, with the, the, the changes in the 70s, when the 70s, the uh, US economy ran into a stone wall with stagflation, the ruling class, and I love the fact that, that Rob uses the term ruling class and not the alternative terms that people banny around, the ruling class went on the offensive and broke that 
that that agreement where productivity would uh, incomes trade union incomes would march right along with uh, productivity that was broken so that was a rare rare moment rare mm -hmm. rare moment but I think the lesson you draw really and I agree with you Pat it's a long march of inequality wealth and income inequality that's only only interrupted and then rather than the way most people look at it you got to explain why it was interrupted not why it exists. It exists because of capitalism. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. Like it comes to see, like people in the eighties and nineties were so indignant about Reagan, you know, breaking Patco and huge tax cuts on the rich, and then Clinton, of course, destroying the welfare state and doing all the financial deregulation that put us in our current spot. Uh, like people were so indignant about, like it's so abnormal to let the wealthier people ra rack up these giant gains while everyone else struggles. Like this is so abnormal. It's on the contrary. On the contrary, Gregor's right. Like the New Deal era, New Deal Great Society era, like that is the exception. And it took just the insane blood, sweat, and tears sacrifices of the '30s labor movements and continuing, of course, through that period. Like to achieve that, and you know, we have lost it, and we are coming back in in our Gilded Age era. And you know, women are losing control of their bodies. It's not right. just the wealth distribution, yeah. too. I mean, uh, you know, we'll see how far this can be pushed. And by the way, I found just that Rand study just to put the actual numbers in here since we mentioned it. So Rand found uh, that uh, under their study, if we'd maintain that Great Society New Deal uh, wealth uh, track that we were on with pay kind of tracking productivity growth across the brackets, that the median uh, US household income would be uh, $57,000. Uh, this was in 2018 when they did their study. So a couple of years ago, $57,000 would be the median income for a, a household. In 2018, it was actually $36,000. Uh, they found that the under the old regime, yeah, the 1% household's yearly income would be $549,000. The number these days is $1.1 million a year. <laughs> like, that is the, I mean, that's a major change. It's trillions of dollars of wealth over these years redistributed back upwards by Reagan, Clinton, and uh, all their senior buddies. And again, yeah, the actual private sector people who, you know, do the investments that uh, create this economy. Greg, that reminds me of you in one of our podcasts saying when you grew up that in your town, and by the way, you grew up, uh, you two grew up just an hour from each other, Terre Haute and Danville, yeah. Yeah. that the, yeah. the wealthiest family, uh, wealthiest doctor in the whole town, you know, lived on the same street with the bricklayer, it just I, had a little bit. It's, it's a funny thing, you, as you get older, you come from a small town in the Midwest, Terre Haute's a big town in the Midwest compared to where I grew up. Sure. But you think the doctor and lawyer in your small town are rich. That's your notion of rich. That's all. I mean, you have television, you see, but that's your notion of rich. Then you go yeah. to college in a big house. and you encounter people from Chicago and you see how they grew up and what their lifestyle is. And hey, there's more rich people. Then eventually, as you get older and you encounter more and more people, you realize you never really knew who the rich were. They don't socialize with you. They don't mix with you. You don't come across them. Their lives are really, and I think you make that point well, Rob, that their lives are just really divorced, live in two different worlds, two entirely different worlds. Hmm. Yeah. The, the other point I'd like to make about income in, in a dis disparity, if you look at the Democrats trying to explain, you know, what's wrong with the voters, don't they know that inflation is down? Don't they know that unemployment is you know, fine. Don't they know that they don't they know all of this? And and, you know, why did how could they possibly not vote for the Democrats when all of these economic factors are just so wonderful? And it reminds me of a, a quote by Galbraith. I'm going to screw this quote up, but uh, the economist Galbraith, he said it reminds him of the story of the six foot man that drowned drowned crossing the raging river that only averaged two feet. <laughs> you know, that that if you look at the general population, half of the people that voted voted for Trump because they felt the econ their their economic situation was horrible. So you have these two disparaging views. Somebody's crazy, somebody's not. Yeah, and people, you know, all the exit poll comments and surveys and people who've been doing canvassing or reporting this stuff, like, you know, in America, people have very ad hoc or I would say a la carte uh, political views. People in America have views on issues that are created by a random number generator. Like only people who are like weird and into politics or are intellectuals or stuff. 
like actually are putting systematic thoughts into like what's right and what that should lead you to think, you know, that's love or hate it. It's niche in the United States to do that kind of stuff. So it's exactly true. You know, half these people are like, oh, and this has been in the press, of course, you know, people saying, yeah, I kind of see him as like a Hitler or like a loose cannon tyrant. I don't know. I voted for him, man. I can't, I, my grind is exhausting me. I people just want a change agent. They'll overlook a lot of stuff to get a change agent. You know, it's true in politics. It's true in relationships. I mean, People, when they're really sick of the rut that they're in, will like roll the dice. They'll try stuff that's not necessarily great, but might get them out. They know where they are isn't tenable. What other option is there, you know? Uh, yeah, ridiculous election from that point of view. I'm doing an article on it right now for In These Times, um, connecting it just to the billionaires that ran the campaign. I'm just going to call it the billionaires election because they ran it wall to wall, basically. Your second chapter reminded me of the book uh, by, uh, I think it was Robert Frank it was called Richestan. Richestan, yes, yes. I read that and sitting at the desk. I, I love that book. And it it it's it, it it talked about when you look at the rich people and we think of the people that are wealthy. I mean, I guess, you know, Greg and I are wealthy relative to the general population, you know, with the, having our our pensions and our medical taken care of and things like that. And then you have the second tier, which is the people that are 20 million to 50 million dollars rich. And then they talk about the rich. I mean, <laughs> the the rich, rich. And that is what your, that's why your chapter two was so cool. It's like, what are we talking about with these people that truly are that 1%? And you go in and discuss their lifestyles and their behavior. Talk about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, this is the part of bo the book everyone's excited to talk about, uh, like when they ask you questions and stuff after talks, because it's completely crazy. And it's a long chapter. And yeah, people always uh, enjoy it. It is a totally just different kind of life. Um, you know, and Robert Frank's book is very good. You know, I have a I cited it for a couple of places in my book. Uh, it's incredible, but you know, his book was written in 2006, I think it was 2007 pre finance, yeah. Yeah, pre finance crisis. And it shows he's like, yeah, see, they won and everything is great. We have this great market. We're making money. It's super good. Like it doesn't have that, you know, tinge of self-reflection that the, uh, coverage since then, uh, has been forced to have, but yeah, it's an incredible thing. I mean, the first thing I tell my students or just anyone, when I talk about this is just the first thing to recognize is something that even some middle-class people are able to achieve, especially by retirement. Like you own your home, just something as small as that you own your home. When I talk to people, you know, who are just typical Americans now, the look on their faces, I say, take a moment and imagine owning your home. I got a mortgage on this place, you know, like imagine you own it. Just the security every morning when you wake up every day, like it's yours, it's yours. And these people, you have a number of homes you own outright. You know, you have your main place and your summer place or your winter place in different parts of America or different countries, of course, uh, depending on your comforts and your pleasures. You know, I think it was C. Wright Mills and the power elite said, and again, this is from memory, my turn to butcher a quote, uh, but he said something to the effect of the wealthy have the ultimate power of changing the world around them by moving around all the time, which they can easily do. I'm sick of waking up to this. I like to wake up to something else. So you own multiple homes of your own. That's a significant distinction there. But, you know, they're real homes. We're talking about like penthouses and huge buildings in New York or London, giant estates in L.A. or Chicago or Paris. I mean, the 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 swanky places that these people have and like just the abject hideousness. I mean, right there behind Pat, like that's one of the, you know, Trump's billionaire wealth is sort of dubious, but it's with the intangible assets he's excited to tell you about. It's not outrageous to say like, these are the kind of conditions that we're talking about, you know? So I like to refer to, for example, uh, there was one place um, in this, I, I owe, uh, owe to a different source that I should thank by name uh, the mansion section of the wall street journal, uh, the journal of course, owned by Rupert Murdoch, the same right-wing Australian billionaire that owns Fox news. And the op-ed page is definitely Fox news with AP English, but the journalism is incredible, you know, cause it's for investors managers and executives and economists you know it's for uh people to know what's going on in business so they can make money and every friday uh the print edition of the journal has the mansion sections a separate section on high high-end real estate not online 
like you'll see the mansion branding on some of its real estate listings, but they don't have that section online where any grubby parole can read it. You do it for the print editions, which is more expensive and only people who are, you know, in business or you know, professors and stuff can afford to read it. It is eye-opening in its own way, uh, in addition to that information from the World Inequality Database, mm -hmm. just to see where it goes is like a different, you know, it is a different part of it. And there was all this photography that I wanted to license for the book. Uh, and when you find out what it costs to license content from News Corp or, Van or Vanity Fair, oh, it sucks so much. This is a digression, but there was a photo that I decided not to use because it was 500 bucks. Jeez. Well, Vanity Fair is just too, that's too damn much. You make, you make so little money from these books. Uh, I couldn't justify it. It was a photo of Rupert Murdoch on his honeymoon with his third wife. Uh, and his third wife, who is now divorced from, of course, because this was like five years ago. Uh, she looks like Lucy Liu with a PhD. Like you cannot understand how young and just beautiful this young woman is. And she's very accomplished, you know, and impressive. She's a rich man's wife. And she's, you know, happily embracing Rupert Murdoch, who is just the crypt keeper, like who just, you cannot understand. He doesn't look good for 9,000 years old. Uh, I really wanted to put that picture in there, but I gave up. So a painful thing. People can look up these listings online and uh, enjoy it that way. That's what I decided. But you take a look at these listings in the mansion section, and they are pretty stunning. I remember there was one in particular on this uh, large LA estate, a large LA estate down in California. And they refer to it in a state, yes, they had 40 rooms or 60, if you included the servants' quarters and the walk-in silver, fur, and wine vaults in the basement. Like, this is the home of the wealthy. Like, they, when they interview these people, they refer to, like, discovering rooms. Like, rooms that they weren't aware of before. Like, oh, how long has there been a bar on this floor of the estate? Like, when you think about how working class people live. When people are forced, you know, their their kids live with them forever because they have college debt or they can't afford today's insane housing prices. So you're living in like your childhood room, like under your parents' gaze and you're almost 30. Meanwhile, you have people who inherited money and are your age and are discovering rooms in their estate. Like these are the class distinctions in consumption. It's not, yes, your hometown lawyer who has a larger nicer house which yes exactly uh as uh greg said that's what you kind of think wealth is when you're a naive kid once you see this stuff it's just like a totally different galaxy of wealth and the thing i always want to refer to as well once you see households this wealthy ones with you know the 60 rooms if you count the servants quarters you know uh the new york city uh penthouse that the hedge fund trader uh ken griffin bought for the highest ever uh u.s real estate purchase for almost a quarter billion dollars 238 million for that one gigantic penthouse or larry ellison our uh, local favorite uh oracle software ceo billionaire who bought one of the hawaiian islands he bought lanai uh back in 2013 technically just 98 percent of the island so you basically <laughs> bought the island there amazing so you look at households this rich it's not just that they have all this money it's not just the security of owning places and the power of being able to go to whatever part of the world or country you'd like to be in this week it's also just recognizing when you have homes and residences on this scale you know i have a three-bedroom place and i can barely keep this place clean it's so big it's so hard to clean it and i'm a lazy dude so it's difficult how would you ever clean and maintain places of this size of course you don't you have your household staff run by what they used to call a butler, and now you call a household manager. Because butler is like valet. It's very old world, and people like to watch Downton Abbey. But modern wealthy people feel that's like, uh, you know, that feels stuffy. That's old world money. And I'm a cool, young, Wall Street, Silicon Valley billionaire, bro. I'm cool. I'm not like that. You'll be my household manager. Pay all my bills and order my food and have the place cleaned and organize the gardener's. And the stuff you learned in particular from Robert Frank's book, which you mentioned, Pat, was especially illuminating on this because he had uh, a number of great interviews with very senior uh, household staff professionals, including people who run like training academies for those kind of positions. Uh, and they refer to, I mean, this is just a quote from Rich's book, which I like so much that I have it in my little wrap on the book. He says, the students at this academy, like a high-end household staff academy it says students learn never to judge their employers whom they call principals if a principal wants to feed her shih tzu braised beef tenderloin steaks every night the butler should serve it up with a smile 
if the principal is in Palm Beach and wants to send his jet to New York to pick up a bottle of Chateau Le Tour from his Southampton cellar, the butler makes it happen, no questions asked. That's from uh, uh, Frank Rich there, a very good book. People should check that out as well. Unbelievable stuff. Like these are people in your home who do everything for you. And then it's not just like you have a chef or someone who cleans once a week, like professional class people often have that kind of household help, you know, or, you know, daycare, which people pay for with half of their money. You know, this is household staff, people who pay your bills for you and do this kind of stuff for you. And soon you're used to strangers in your home with you all the time. And you learn incredible stuff from rich. Like uh, I remember they specifically mentioned uh, you learn in the academy that wealthy people like to have all their stuff in the same places in their different homes, like in their bedrooms, for example. So they want like their socks in the same drawer and their medications in the same place in the medicine cabinet in their different homes in New England and Florida and the West Coast and so forth. It's fascinating, fascinating shit to take a look inside the lives of these uh, ruling yeah. class scumbags, just squandering the wealth that we have so many needs to use. Yeah, they could have a hundred, they could have a hundred people working for one person, the, the, the travel agent, a cook, a chef, a chauffeur, uh, you know, it, it, not just a couple of people, a hundred people, you know, so it's, absolutely. It's, that is uh, definitely before we question. get carried away, before we get wealthy in their lifestyles, I, I get the Wall Street Journal and I got my mansions this morning. It's Friday. And I find a, I want to ask you about this because I find it a very interesting phenomena. So if I take mansions, and put it in front of one person, they say, oh, that's disgusting. That's just uh, that's just incredible uh, excess, et cetera, et cetera. Fine. But there's five people I put in front of which envy that. They yeah. they look at it yeah. and they, they see yeah. themselves there. And and I there's one one friend of mine, I hope he doesn't watch the podcast, but I'd show him mansions. He'd, oh, I don't, I don't care about that. And then I would sneak back in the room and I'd see he had it open and he was reading every article and check it. There's this envy factor in America. Absolutely. It's amazing. So I'm Absolutely. sure your readers, your readers, most of them are disgusted with what you write. But I would venture that many, many people hide the fact that they envy that. There was a, and I'd, 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 if you can find this somewhere, I'd appreciate it. There was a poll taken 15 years ago. I've lost it since. It asked people, what about the 1%? And in this poll, 30% uh, 20, 20, uh, of the people said they, 20% of the people said they were in the 1%. They believe themselves to be in the 1%. Uh, that's, I remember that poll. I should have got And another 29% said they're going to be. So when oh, you look God. at America and you look at the, that, isn't that our problem? Isn't that really our, isn't that your problem? in conveying what you're trying to convey to people for change. Oh, uh, absolutely, Greg, yeah. Uh, and that's something that, yeah, I remember, they, I, I, I do recall like that study and that's so annoying and I wish I had remembered it when I was putting the book together. But I talk about the phenomenon a lot. Like the US is, I don't wanna say unique, but it is a strong outlier in this tendency of large proportions of the working class and certainly the professional class to see themselves as, you know, Imminent millionaires. Yes, uh, I might just be some working class schmuck right now making sandwiches for Wall Street douchebags on their lunch hour. But one day I'll be one of them. I mean, I don't want to mm -hmm. become a financier, mm -hmm. but I'll I'll invent a thing and sell it to Jeff Bezos. Like everyone imagines that some tech entity is going to buy up their half-baked idea, make them rich somehow. It is one of the major problems. Yeah, is that every small business owner thinks that they're about to be Microsoft. Uh, so many working class people think that they will be, you know, either part of the world of wealth or, again, that these guys will benefit us in some other way. And in that chapter on the lies and alibis of the rich, that's one of the things I talk about quite a bit is so many ways that these wealthy people have of justifying their existence to people like Americans who are relatively egalitarian in their outlook, despite it all. Uh, and it's all based on stuff like this. It's like, oh, you don't want to be mad at us. You could be us. Just, you know, work hard if you would grind more. You could totally be Mark Zuckerberg and a guy who controls one of the most important media platforms in the world because he was making a hot or not site on uh, about Harvard at just the right moment. Uh, incredible to see people that deluded. But, you know, no one knows any of these details. Uh, but it is a, like a major obstacle. Like it's mixed with envy, you know, and they know that, of course, like they recognize that there are a lot of people are uh, aspirational, as they say in marketing literature. 
And, you know, maybe in time I'll have a mansion like this. You won't, of course. But as long as a significant chunk of people believe it, yeah, you know, they'll be they'll be voting for Trump and they'll be laughing off sensible socialist appeals. Uh, it's painful, but that's in this country. It was made by capitalist attorneys. Like, that's who wrote the Constitution as lawyers for the great mer merchants and uh, commercial interests and, you know, agricultural interests, of course, at that time of the country. And it's like the most baked into its DNA country in terms of capitalism, you know, at least the European Union, even in Britain, like it has that whole long history and there's pre-capitalist institutions like churches and guilds that play some mitigating role and make anchors for people to come together and organize against this stuff and help them remember like the realities of this, like you're not going to become the king you know? and you're probably not even going to become a banker. Like we should like have, you know, we should have, we should have a labor party uh, in Britain, like they used to have at one time, uh, that would be very helpful in these kind of moments. But yeah, yeah that uh, tendency of envy is like a big thing that undermines, you know, building solidarity. Yeah, it's tough. That is an yeah. American thing we deal with. For some reason, I like what chapter four, the lies, where the, you know, all of these um, memes or thoughts, they have such prominence, they have such capital with the general public of, you know, well, why do you resent uh, you know, why do you resent uh, Bill Gates? You know, he worked hard and he earned his money and he, you know, I mean, we did a book on Bill Gates. He's a, he's kind of a dick, really. I mean, oh, yeah. he, oh, he, yeah. he's a cruel person and he, uh, I, you know. He's, he's I, a bully. Many of these he, guys. He's are. a bully. He's a misogynist. He's a, he's not a good person. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, in, it's, 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 um, I don't, I don't know. It, 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 the, these, these, I, I think part of it, going back to your other channel, part of it, people just don't realize how rich, rich is and how disgusting it is. I, I, I remember short story. My son was a, is a contract painter and he paints a lot of high end houses on um, the East side, uh, Microsoft, Redmond, big houses. And I remember taking off a day and hanging out with him back when the economy crashed. So this must have been 2008, 2009. Everything was going bad. The housing sales were tanking. And I went to look at a house he was painting. It had a safe room. It had a huge theater room. It was a multi, multi-million dollar house. He was doing this in, inside treatment of just, you know, extraordinary lacquer finishes, everything. And I talked to the realtor who was staging it. And I said, are you nervous about selling a house, this spec house, this big, this fancy, this rich uh, in this in this economy? And she looked at me like I was crazy. She said, well, no one's going to have a mortgage. They're, they're going to pay cash for this. And this won't be their first home. This probably will be their fourth home. You know, it's yeah. like, what? what do you, you're an idiot. When you have a home like this, you don't go get a mortgage. You Certainly just, not. Pay, you know, it just <laughs> like holy crap! I'm in a different universe. Yeah, it's just a whole other like set of rules and processes, you know. And bear in mind too, like you know, like a rich family may among their properties have one or two that have a low interest rate mortgage on it. For all that financial management purposes, keep your, keep your credit rating where you want it or keep, you know, your wealth manager happy with you, you know, okay, we'll finance this one. We don't really need to, but why not? It'll be good for our, you know, relationships or our credit rating or whatever. But that is like the case. And it's such a just broadly different reality. I mean, you know, that wealthy, you already have more than you need. So buy some more houses that when again, when you own that many houses, the corollary, of course, is that they're usually empty, completely yes. empty all yeah. the time. And we have all these people, U.S. Armed Service veterans and young people who are just like on the streets here in the Northwest. I mean, you know, I'm sure also back you know, in Pennsylvania, it's been a while since I lived in the Midwest, but I remember well, it's a global problem. People are unhoused because you you cannot, I cannot believe what has happened with rents in the um, 13 years I've lived just in the Northwest. It's, I mean, landlords have lost their minds. They are using software now to like collude on their pricing. I expect even Trump's Justice Department will probably come down on the algorithms they're using these days. So yeah, it's like so brutal for most people. And you look at these people, look at the people, you know, the clientele for that realtor and that, those conditions. Yeah, aren't you worried about selling in this market? Well, for the high end, the markets, I mean, it's weakening just lately. It'll come roaring back now with Trump, I'm sure. 
yeah. but like the high end is very strong. It's amazing how dissimilar high end markets for all kinds of stuff. Amazing how different they look from the mass markets, from travel, for residential, you know, for um, you know, real estate, for you know, entertainment. I mean, just for any kind of activity, the way the top end looks. And of course, as I say also in that chapter, there is no word that is used more in high end marketing than exclusive. Mm -hmm. exclusive mm -hmm. destination exclusive uh, events exclusive travel options the whole point of a course is to exclude the masses and mainly in the form of charging a huge amount of course so i have i'm just amazed by how frequently that gets used because in society people are so eager for more inclusion and you know seeking inclusion within their institutions which i think is very positive but within our economy it's well of course you want to exclude people because they don't have any money just watching both of those get maintained is an interesting process yeah Let's talk politics. Um, isn't it fun to open your phone and, and see another cabinet member and go, what the hell is that? What? I, I It just, it, it's almost like a Saturday Night Live skit. I, I It's bizarre. Um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, he's coming out hot with these uh, appointments. Like they're all just like nobodies from the house or from right wing media who have like no independent base and Trump just realizes that'll make them reliant on him. You know, loyal as he likes to say, but remember loyalty is a two way street. People are loyal to each other. If people are loyal to you and you fire them when they're inconvenient, that's not loyalty. That's obedience and control and hierarchy, which is what he really wants from these appointments. But it is amazing though. Like he's coming out so goofy with these. It looks like he's going to shoot himself in the dick, right? With this first one with gets, I mean, when I saw this, I had the point and it was in the journal just this morning, like already at least five Republican senators have said there's no way he's going to get through confirmation and they have a three Senate seat majority. So he's going to lose. I mean, I'm sure he'll withdraw his nomination. That's always what these losers do. But bear in mind, in order to avoid his sex report coming out in the House, he already resigned from Congress. So when he loses his appointment vote or jumps out beforehand, he'll be out of national government completely, which is hilarious. So a strong start. Uh, this is kind of Bush's Harriet Myers moment, you know, in 2006 when he tried to put his personal attorney, or maybe it was the uh, White House attorney, Harriet Myers, up for the oh, Supreme yeah. Court. It was immediately shot down in the Senate, you know. But Trump's doing it, in, in, and he's been in office negative 21 days so far, and already, like, a major defeat. Like, it, it won't get through the Senate, and this is, like, his most high-profile pick is about crazy it is. Uh, like, already almost certainly going to fail. You know, the Senate said there's no way they're going to do recess appointments you know they might like trump enough because he gets them the tax cuts they want but you know they're not going to give up their own power it's the senate you know these people work very hard to for their evil seats in power they're not going to surrender their constitution i don't know i don't know don't un, don't underestimate it, it's yeah, yeah, they're, yeah they're, I, they're grubby I, power hungry people too though that's yeah <laughs> that's true so, so yeah. you know it's amazing to see that yeah the politics of this is fun but you know the harris campaign i mean you know she had a boost of real energy when she took over from the 900 year old guy i mean fundamentally this is all biden's fault for running again if he hadn't announced that and tied the democrats to his shambolic mentally incompetent corpse like person and had let us had a primary that would have had a socialist in it and made the winner whomever it was it would not have been harris who sucked at every campaign she's ever run uh, it would have get, had forced them to run on an issue, and maybe they could have beat the legacy of inflation and Biden's uh, unpredictability. We'll never know now, of course, because Harris instead, mm -hmm. being the ultimate empty suit, decided to speed run the Clinton campaign. And I just thought, like, this campaign deserves to lose and will. And they did. Every yeah. woman I knew told me that women would never let Trump back in after Roe. And I kept think I kept saying, OK, but I kept thinking, yes, you will. And of course they did. You know, yeah, people are mad about inflation more than they care about politics. That's only for certain people like us who are like into it. So it's rough politically right now. But um, if Trump's already hurting himself with these nominees, I mean, you know, there's some political capital gone. And I always think and pe lots of people are drawing this point too. shut up about this. Uh, the analogy I thought of when the election results came in and a lot of people, too, have been drawing this analogy from Chapo to Corey Robin. Uh, it's 20. It's 2004. Because 20 years ago, the last time the Republicans won the popular vote until last week. So it's a rare event these days when that occurs. 
and Bush came in and it was very demoralizing because of how insane Bush's first term was, which is significantly worse than Trump's term, no matter what people say. People forget about those events because uh, they were more than five minutes ago and everyone forgot it. But he came in saying, I have political, there was the phrase he used, Bush did at that time, you know, in the midst of the Iraq and Afghanistan occupations and all this stuff, he said, I have political capital and I'm going to spend it. And the big thing was privatizing Social Security and they just completely ate shit on that. So God willing, this will resemble that, uh, the early blundering with the uh, appointments. Most of them will just be dangerous, loose cannons, like the idiot Christian nationalist Fox News host who's going to be running the Defense Department, for example. Yeah, so with bad, all, the, uh, all, the, all the white supremacist tattoos all, on his Yeah, head. like crazy Christian nationalist traditions, you know, pretty menacing stuff to have at the senior position the senior civilian position for the military and that appointment could die but i don't think it looks too objectionable to the senate i think it'll go through so bad enough but the gets thing is an early blunder that's going to have him bleeding yeah. looks like so we'll you know say, god willing it'll be like bush too and not much will be accomplished that'll hurt the country too much but i'm sure they'll at least get a big fat tax cut through like no matter what like that will happen yeah, that'll that'll work the tariffs yeah, I, are really the big question mark for the economy it depends on how much he follows through anything like what he promised on a campaign trail will have inflation again and probably a recession too yeah. uh and that should be enough to kill the republicans in the midterms but we'll all be surprised together Hey, we're getting towards the end here, and uh, you have Chapter 7, The Plan. Greg, uh, what, what's your solution to this? Before I ask Rob what his plan is, I mean, w w we've stated the problem, and the problem is <laughs> pretty clear. What's if the solution? So clear, what's the if solution? It's so clear, if, if it's so clear, if the solution or if the problem is so clear, how come the Democrats didn't grasp what the problem was? and offer a solution to it. I mean, you're seeing um, an elevation, a, a growth, a rise of right-wing populism around the world. It's not just Trump. People here mm -hmm. are so in, uh, insular, they don't know what's going on with Urban or with uh, AFD in Germany or with Maloney in Italy yeah. or, or, or on and on, Modi in India. Around the world, there's a phenomena. If you're a thoughtful person, you start with a phenomena. It's it, it, and no one is doing that in this country. Commentators aren't looking at it. I, 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 I hope that I'm taking a a larger view than most people do by looking at that phenomena, and saying clearly, there's a dissatisfaction worldwide, in the wake of 2007, eight, and nine, the great crisis we had, in the wake of the pandemic, in in the wake of the crisis of 2000. Uh, in, in, in the wake of all these things, the healthcare crisis in America, that there's a mass dissatisfaction out there. And, and it, is, it is expressing that dissatisfaction through these right-wing populists. And any answer that doesn't address those questions, if they, if they think that they can label Trump a fascist and get away with that, and that's it, and not offer a solution, they're going to be really embarrassed in the forthcoming elections. People are looking for something. They've, they've turned their back on centrism. So the people are now uh, hustling this idea in the Democratic Party that, well, the problem was that Biden was too left, too progressive, and Kamala followed suit. We got to go back. That's exactly the wrong take. What we need is something more radical on the left. The Tea Party movement had its effect not only on the Republican Party, but on politics in general. We have nothing like that on the left. Whenever Bernie had a good thing going, he got in line. I mean, I was disgusted to see, and everybody else was hailing it on the left. That was tough, yeah. Bernie comes out the day after the election and says, this is what they did wrong. Yeah, well, great. For, Very I'm accurate saying, statement. What were you but, doing? But, you, were, you, were out there, yeah. you were out there pushing this. You were pushing this yeah. agenda. Great statement, but time. watching him during the campaign was really rough. Oh, boy, yeah, it was. So, I mean, I'll leave it at that. I mean, I have more to say about it, but I want to hear what both of you yeah. have to say. About Chapter that. 7. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I when you know, of course, one of these people tends to think that you know Sanders and you know the squad and whatever are kind of what's positive in national level electoral politics. You know, um, watching them make the compromises they think they need to be making and shaking my head has been a difficult process. But I mean, fundamentally, these are very positive figures. They put all of these very sensible, progressive, all the way to socialist ideas out there. Medicare for all is now like the base demand that eight. Wait, 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 Rob, 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 that's something near and dear to me. 
They gave that up. They all oh, yeah. gave it up. Kamala gave it up when she ran in 2016. Oh, of course. She said, Absolutely. She walked away course. from it. But they've the all walked away. There's no movement. Happen. Oh, yeah. And there, there's a movement out there. It's led by people that care. But but the politicians aren't engaged. The Democratic oh, Party strongly party agree. Party. That's absolutely the case. I mean, Kamala ran away. I mean, that was to me. That was everyone's so excited about the Trump Harris debate. She showed that he's very unstable. Yeah, that worked out great. But I love the moment where he said, like, he's good. She's gonna do Medicare for all. She's gonna have Medicare and give it to everybody. Oh no! And then she went, I would never do that. I would never ever give you peasants health insurance. I would never never ever do that. And of course, it just makes her unpopular like doesn't make you more popular when you run away from what 85 percent of the democratic voter base wants you should have to adopt it once it's that high it's amazing this amazing running away from one of the most popular policies in the united states during this big political debate like that's who he's going after she's going to give you something very positive that media people are scared of uh like i don't tax, tax, tax the rich that's how, how does that poll popular, unbelievably popular programs that we would never run on. And I mean, that was the Clinton magic. You know, we all heard that she was advising Harris and that was her big thing is policies don't matter. That's why I, Hillary became president. And so she followed that advice, <laughs> refused to have any policy, even like the minimum wage, which every, like that's the strong, raising that as the strongest polling in the world has been raised in freaking 20 years, almost. It's insane. And people, oh, well, she did run on it. And what they mean is there's a page on her website that says we should raise the minimum wage. Like that is not running on a policy. If you grudgingly have it on your platform website, Sorry, what she ran on was, I'm a Republican. I love Liz Cheney. I'd put a Republican at my administration. And she said on The View, which a lot of women watch, which is what was supposed to save them. She said, what would I do differently from Joe Biden, who you associate with the post-COVID inflation that destroyed your ability to shop for groceries? You know, that wasn't really Biden's responsibility. It's mostly about China and U.S. reopening at different times. Although Biden sanctioned the Russian oil, which was like half of the inflation. So some of it's his fault. That's fine, I guess. We said, what would I do differently? Well, nothing. Oh, no, I put a Republican in my cabinet. Just like it's a campaign that deserves to lose. They deserve not, to eat shit. Not just really any Republican. Me. Not just any Republican. The worst Republicans. He ran with uh, with uh, Cheney. Cheney. Yeah. She had yeah, Liz Cheney, Cheney so beside her. God. She didn't have Bernie Sanders beside her. She had Liz no. Cheney beside her. No, well, no, no. I, Bernie was embarrassing herself, but she wouldn't elevate him to that point. Yeah, pretty rough. So, you know, so so the point is, what do I think? You know, what is the plan? I think the first thing we should recognize is like the limited in the United States, like national politics is always going to be so poisoned against anything that's against the class interests of the ruling class, you know, the owning class. They own most of the stock in the corporate world. So these giant corporations that fuck us all the time, like it's their property primarily. They own most of those assets. You know, they have their class interests. They donate heavily to the Democratic and Republican parties to make sure. And then horrible to watch like members of the left wing representation, the squad getting picked off in their primaries this year, not by the Chamber of Commerce, the traditional socialist adversary, but by, by Israel and by the APAC, yeah. the cleansing lobby. Like that's that's rough to watch, you know. Yeah. So to me, like the thing we really need to focus on is the labor movement. It's as Greg said, like at the grassroots where you have these movements for incredibly popular things like Medicare for all, which would make our lives better. And I have insurance through my academic job and it, it's, you, know, you could have a lot worse. It sucks. Like it's time on the phone and paying bills and co-pays that add up surprisingly quickly and, you know, network limitations and coverage exemptions. It sucks and it costs so much and it's a dreadful product, but it's at the grassroots level where there's support for that, where there's support for pro labor stuff like the pro act or car check, you know, uh, all the climate activism, God knows, is at the grassroots level and not at the level of the National Party who support climate action when they're out of office. And when they're in office, you'll have the IRA and you'll have like you know, Biden's Inflation Reduction Act, you know, which has like some sturdy, respectable climate related stuff in there. Climate abatement, uh, lots of stuff for renewables, which they need, but matched by increased funds for drilling and oil and gas industry subsidies like like that's the best we'll get. So the base is the place to focus, especially when the national scene is so screwed up as it is right now. Uh, I would say the, the place where you have the biggest force multiplier is with like the labor movement. And I'm lucky to be in an AFT local myself on my campus. Uh, a lot of teachers don't have that. Uh, and I'm our locals rep to the Pierce County Central Labor Council. And it's fascinating. Like the best thing listeners can do if you feel helpless is like just get to attached 
to an organization that does like something get into your union get into a dsa local there's plenty of other cool socialist entities beyond the dsa i live in such a safe swing state that i use my presidential vote to vote for the party of socialism and liberation who are very cool and Mm -hmm. fairly marginal but have like very very impressive uh you know uh platforms there's there's positive figures we can turn to and there's movements that we can support and it just does so much i mean i always say this but it's done a lot for my quality of life uh to be attached to any kind of actual activism where you're talking to humans in a room in person with them actually uh it's surprising after the increasing isolation of this country especially during and since covid uh, to experience what it's like to be in a room of people and some of them are your friends and you get to know them and you have an annoying moment and a fun moment and it's like you're a real human being and that's how we build up these organizations that'll get us things from the minimum wage up to medicare for all or god help us say more socialized economies by having those organic links so uh, that's a lot of what that last chapter is about is looking at the re- labor i would say the labor renaissance we're having i wouldn't call it a resurgence yet um, but a lot has happened compared to the dog days of several years ago for labor. Yeah. So, um, well, they're a, they're a hot mess. They need to do something. I mean, it, again, it's like a day late and a dollar short. James Carville came out and said we should have we should have voted for Bernie. You know, I mean, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Carville. That is. Yeah. No, oh, that's, I would good. Love, that's good. I would love to meet Carville and draw a face on his head. Like that is right. That man right. Spent, you know, but during the campaign, it was shut up, you mouthy broads. Yeah. Exactly. Shut up about your left wing demands. And now it's like, you know, Bernie was right. Oh, well, now that it doesn't matter, we're right. That yeah. guy should get egged by a mob of Palestinian orphan children, in my opinion. That's, that's there true. Is, that's there true. is no embarrassing punishment that is uh, and too you go, uh, harsh for James Carville. You know who was the biggest Bernie bro? Joe Rogan. Yeah, who just endorsed Trump. And, and, and Joe Rogan, Rogan was the biggest Bernie bro. Loved him. Sanders went on and everyone gave him shit because Rogan sucks on other issues like trans rights. And he does. That's what happens when you go on someone's media is they have stupid positions and you don't necessarily endorse right. them when you go on it, as everyone knows, when they're not just having an axe to grind of crushing the Sanders campaign so we can get winning Joe Biden in there, whose fault all of this is. Right, right. Hey, thanks Thanks so much for being on. Tell me about your work with Rob, I mean, with um, Nathan um, Robinson and the current affairs. We had him on last week. I love that guy. He's, he's, he's such a great guy. And you, you uh, do you write articles for them associated with economics or how are you connected with the official economist for current affairs? Yeah, uh, current affairs is great. I really recommend it to uh, your listenership because it's a fun socialist magazine and there's a lot of great socialist media out there that's one thing we've stayed strong on for all of our decades of defeat is having decent media i would say uh you know i'm a big jacoban fan i write about tech for them all the time you know they're great but you know it's serious politics in jacoban which again is great you need fun in a movement and current affairs is fun the way that like a lot of other left-wing media aren't necessarily so fun uh nathan is definitely the center of that he is a uh, really fun character and of course has a brand new book out with uh noam chomsky who's uh you know appears to be in his extremist now i'm very sad to say he was a mentor of mine along with uh, so many people in the u.s left uh but robinson's book with him is very 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 good it's a very very readable introduction to you know criticizing u.s foreign policy uh holiday season coming up people love books people should check that one out yeah. but current affairs is fantastic uh they just hit their 50th issue uh really fun magazine it's beautiful and yeah i write a lot of econ for them i am the house economist of the magazine Mm -hmm. a title i thought of myself because i liked it (laughs) uh and it's just a great uh a great great venue i just had an article for them in the last issue on uh uh, what migration is like for the rich relative to normal people and it's as different as it is uh, for everything else that class segregation runs internationally and if you're wealthy you can buy a real estate uh, investment for a couple hundred thousand dollars and qualify for a residency in a lot of countries uh, including in europe and stuff and some of them are scaling back the programs because they're so popular they're driving up real estate prices in these cities the programs work too well you know whereas the average schmuck you you're getting locked up and deported by donald trump in some insufferable 100 degree hellhole in latin america you know it's a very different picture so i wrote about that for affairs um the issue before that i reviewed um norberg uh, johan norberg's book uh he's the great uh, libertarian economist in scandinavia who talks about how horrible scandinavian social democracy really is 
uh, very, very poor book. He wrote the Capitalist Manifesto. Uh, and it's a very, oh, yeah. a very poor book. Uh, I read that and parts of his old book, which it turned out I had also read years ago, and wrote a somewhat unflattering article on that. So yeah, I write a lot for affairs, uh, criticizing bad economists and just talking about what's uh, happening in the marketplace uh, from a left-wing view. But um, current affairs, I think, is your best left-wing media dollar in my personal view. Uh, it's, people are subscribed it's, to it's, them. Chris, it's Christmas present. Just subscribe. That's simple as that. Yeah, you know, I'm giving those subscriptions away. You know, it's nice. And people get it through the year. So it's not just a one-off thing you unwrap. It comes all the time. It's lovely. So I recommend that. But yeah, that's my involvement with those characters. Uh, some of my favorite left-wing media there. Uh, very small. Need your support. <laughs> yeah, good. Hey, Rob, thanks for thanks for showing up and spending out. What fun. This is a, this is a great... A fun, really a fun... Uh, fun great way discussion. to spend noon on a Friday uh, talking to somebody that wrote a great book and knows a hell of a lot more on the subject than me and maybe maybe even Greg. I don't know. So you're, you're a breath of fresh air. Thanks for coming. Thanks oh, my pleasure, much. Joe. Keep it yeah. in. And, and watch, watch out. I saw you had a cat on your lap. Be, please be yes. careful with those cats. I will. Yeah. She's on the couch now, so I'm What's safe. It, yeah. you don't, People are going to eat them. People are going to uh, eat yeah, them. Yeah, just, just, that, that's, just no, that's a great point. That's just, a great point. I saw a foreigner the other day, and I thought, are you going to eat my cat? I can't, be, be can't be too careful is all I'm saying. Okay. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Pleasure, guys.